Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing so well today, Tim. Thank you for asking. I hope you're doing well, and I hope everyone out there is doing well. Yes, and uh, I I am doing well. Thank you for asking. And uh, I think we have a great episode today. Not unlike every episode, Lance, but this one we're speaking with author Maureen Boyle, who, who she's written several true crime books. And this one is called Shallow Graves, The Hunt for the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. So we're talking about her book about the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer today, which is interesting, I think, to us, Lance, because we're both from this area and have not heard of it until uh, this book. Exactly. And the book is great. And Maureen does a great job breaking down the 11 women who went missing over the spring and summer of 1988 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. If anyone's familiar with that town, that small city, it is known as the Whaling City. And this is where Moby Dick, Frederick Douglass and Herman Melville all have had a significant impact in New Bedford. The book is great. I urge everyone to check it out. I listened to it on Audible. It's a great listen as well. And she's got a new book out called The Ghost, The Murder of Police Chief Greg Adams and the Hunt for His Killer that came out more recently. But get them both. There are links in the show notes. We guarantee you'll love them. The Crawl Space Guarantee. Yes, you will love these books. And Lance, we want to tell our listeners about our regular crime and culture live shows that happen every other Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. We used to do a true crime night every Thursday night. Now we've switched it to twice a month every other Tuesday. And this week we're having on Sarah Kayleen. It happened last night if you're listening to this on Wednesday, February 2nd. But join us next time on February 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern for the Crime and Culture live show. You can watch it on Twitter, YouTube, and we'll soon be streaming on Instagram and TikTok once we get to 1,000 TikTok followers. So follow us over there as well. Yes, that is Tuesday, February 15th, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have a person on whose name has been popping up in our world over the past few weeks. She is Catherine Jones. She is the co-director of Outreach and Partnership Development for the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. She was herself incarcerated at 13. She came out, and she is a force to be reckoned with. You need to listen to this show. And we had an episode with her just a few weeks back, so check that out on Crawl Space. And Lance, we're going to be launching a new subscription service soon where we're going to be playing all of our ad-free episodes and some bonus content. And there will be more info on that in the coming weeks. We're going to be launching it in February 2022. So look out for that. And Lance, one more announcement. We are going to CrimeCon in Las Vegas in 2022. It is April 29th to May 1st, 2022. It's going to be a blast. We're going to be most likely doing two different live shows there, one Crawl Space and one Missing, and uh, I can't wait. It has been how long, Tim, since we've been to CrimeCon? I mean, we're going this year three. Yeah, it'll be three years since we've attended a CrimeCon, yeah. Yeah. I have been dying to see people's faces. I've been dying to interact with the listeners. I can't wait to see them. I hope uh, everyone who can attend will attend. And we do know that CrimeCon is following all of the necessary precautions. I do believe that you need a proof of vaccination to attend. So even if you don't bring it anyway, bring a picture of it, you don't want to get all the way to Vegas and then get shut out of that event or any of the other offshoot events that are happening out there. And if you've been on the fence about attending and you need something to push you over, that fence you can go to crimecon.com and use the promo code crawlspace tim tell them what they've won lance it's 10 percent off standard badges with code crawlspace so use code crawlspace when you purchase a standard badge at crimecon.com thanks a lot for listening everybody we're going to play a commercial here and then we'll be right back with maureen boyle Welcome to the podcast, author Maureen Boyle. How are you today? Very good. Very good. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you for agreeing to do this interview. Just a real quick piece of uh, back information here. A few weekends ago, I wanted to clean the house. I had thought to myself that it's overdue for a good cleanse, and I wanted to listen to a book while I did that. And needless to say, after putting on your book, Shallow Graves, on Audible... 
I didn't clean the place. I still live in a dirty house because of you. So thank you very much for that. Thrilled. (laughs) (laughs) Anything I can do to keep people from uh, doing housework and that sort of thing. Well, I did. I did manage to clean, so so we're we're good. We're not we're not living in uh in in filth anymore. So uh, you can rest easy on that. But your book is amazing, and we had never heard of this before. You never heard of the case? We couldn't believe it. We're I'm from Massachusetts. I grew up in Medford, and I I had and and I do a crime podcast, and I'd never heard of the case until your book. It's incredible. I mean, it's not even like we were too young either. This was 1988, 1989. I mean, it was on the news. I know. And and, and that's one of the reasons why I did the book is that there's so many people uh, in Massachusetts who do not know of this case about the killer uh, and about the victims. And I really think uh, much more attention needs to be paid to this case in particular. Absolutely. So you mentioned that was one of the reasons that you decided to write the book. Um, wh- what is your background? I've been a newspaper reporter for more years than I care to admit. You know, I started way back when I was still in high school. I was a a newspaper reporter primarily covering cops and crime and courts in uh, New Hampshire and here in Massachusetts, uh, in New Bedford and in Brockton. Uh, Back in 88, I was newspaper reporter at the Standard Times. That's a daily paper in New Bedford. And I was covering this case in 88. So I was really intimately aware of everything that was going or what I thought was everything that was going on with the case until I started re-reporting things for this book and discovered there's just so much more about the case that I did not know about. And here we are. So for those of the listeners who don't know this case, the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer, you covered it in 1988, and then you recovered it with your book, Shallow Graves. Uh, that was 2017, right? That that was published? Yes, came out in 2017. Um, yeah, back in, in, for those who don't know any, anything about the case, back in 1988, roughly between March and April of 88 to September of 1988, 11 women went missing in the, the in New Bedford, the common thread with all of the women was that uh, they were all addicted to drugs. The bodies of nine of them were eventually found on the highways that surround New Bedford. That would be 195, 140, and um, uh, 88 going to Horseneck Beach and Westport. Uh, none of the bodies, uh, interestingly enough, were found in New Bedford. They're all found just right outside. If you think of uh, a donut. And New Bedford in the center of a donut, and the bodies were found in that circle surrounding New Bedford, the highway circle surrounding them. Interesting. Yeah, that makes me think of uh, like geo profiling based on where the uh, the bodies uh, were found. Yeah, a, a lot's been discussed about like why uh, none of the bodies were found in New Bedford. Why weren't any of the bodies found in the city? Was there a reason for it? Did they not want New Bedford police to investigate the case? Or uh, was the killer more familiar with the uh, suburbs around New Bedford? And, you know, and despite the uh, the title of the book, the the women were found right off the highway. So imagine if a car pulls over to the side of the road and the killer can just pick up the body and put them right uh, inside the tree line on the highway. So that if you're driving by, you don't see the body, but if you stopped along the highway and you know, like to change a tire or uh, perform some bodily function, that is, um, you, you might st- stumble upon the body. And that's how several of the bodies had been found. Someone just happened to uh, stop along the highway. So take us back to uh, 1988, your days as a crime reporter. Had you reported on anything that I I guess you, you hadn't because this is so unique and probably once in a lifetime coverage opportunity for a crime reporter? How did this even how did this come to you? And then when did you start putting it together that this that these were probably connected? Prior to this, I was doing a lot of stories on heroin addiction. Now, in the 1980s, unlike today, we're Everyone is very familiar with opiate addiction. There's uh, many more services available for those who are addicted. Back then, there wasn't. There was a real need in New Bedford. And I was doing a number of stories about women who were addicts, women who were on the street who were addicts, uh, the nexus between 
prostitu- street prostitution in the city and heroin addiction. And also some of the assaults on women who were on the street uh, by some of the Johns on the street. Uh, So I was very familiar with what was going on at that time, but I never dreamed that there would be an actual serial killer, especially in a city like New Bedford, which is a very, very tight knit community, a very... um, People there are very, very hardworking. For those who aren't familiar with the city of New Bedford, it's a large fishing community, very family oriented. People stay there. It's a, it, it really is. It's a very historic and it's a really lovely city. Yeah, I think you explained it really well when you said people stay there. It has a really incredible history of whaling, and that industry went away. So the town uh, was affected by that. It was was impacted by that. But the people there, when you're describing communities and saying like salt of the earth people, like anytime someone says it, I think New Bedford, just like that tight knit, close, warm, welcoming type community. And it seems like everyone's related to someone by marriage. You know, there it, it, it is a city where, you know, my husband sometimes would joke with me is like, you don't have to talk so softly in restaurants. No one's listening to our conversations. And it's like, yes, they are, because everyone knows everyone and everyone will can hear what you're saying to people, you know, to someone. It's so th- that is one of the reasons why I was really so shocked at with this case. Um, and why people, uh, the police were so stymied in in the search for the killer, because I would have thought that the killer would have been caught immediately. Yeah, exactly. I think that's sort of what we were getting to there is that you, you have this community that people know, you know, everyone knows everyone. And someone got away with doing this in just over the course of a year. Yes. In, under a year. That's what's so frightening. It goes from. Yeah. From uh, you know roughly March April to September, and then and and the bodies were found between July of eighty eight going into nineteen eighty nine, and it, I think one of the problems with the case for investigators was that by the time they knew that there was a serial killer in the area, the killer had stopped killing, and as a result of that, it was really difficult to track him. And they also had to go back into time and retrace the steps of the women. And while in a couple of cases, women were reported missing immediately by their their family, family and friends, there were some cases where uh, the victims were either not reported missing at all or reported missing uh, sometime later. So it was really, really hard to say, okay, when was the last time you saw so-and-so? And since none of the women, only basically the the women were not employed in nine to five jobs. So you can't say, well, they were last seen at work at such and such time. The timeline was really very, very fluid. And what was it like back then, back back when this occurred? What what was the town like? Was it uh, fearful or or was there a bit of a distance there? It's interesting. There there were some people who were very, very fearful. Uh, There were some people who felt, oh, no, it doesn't affect me. Uh, So there was that split. The families that were affected and the ripple effect of the killings, I think, really did affect a good number of people in the city and the surrounding communities. Those that were more well-to-do in the communities were, were not affected quite as much. And there were, of course, there was always a couple of people who would say, oh, well, you know, it, it was only happening to those people, not to uh, not to the rest of us. Now, keep in mind, this was also a time before uh, heroin addiction, opiate addiction really made the news, made the national news, made um, state news. So people were thinking, well, that's not going to happen to our family. And as we all know, a heroin addiction can happen and touch any family. For your book, did you rely on interviews that you had done, or uh, perhaps even tapes of interviews or anything with law enforcement or uh, family members back then? Back then, in the olden days, uh, <laughs> uh, we really didn't uh, tape interviews. We would write them out. Uh, and I did a lot of stories during that period of time. So I had background to rely on in terms of scenes and things like that. But I did go back and re-interview people, both law enforcement and family members, and then uh, some other records that I was able to obtain uh, to give a little bit more depth to the story. 
And, I mean, you know, keep in mind, I had thought that I knew everything about the case because I was there in covering it. Uh, but in the re-reporting for the book, I discovered there was a lot more going on behind the scenes in the investigation than any of us knew publicly. That is a, that's what they call a big market tease right there. So <laughs> well played. How closely back then did you work with law enforcement while you were covering this? Oh, I was pestering them all the time. <laughs> I was pestering them all the time. It's, it's, you know, they had a job to do and there were certain things that they would not tell reporters about. And it was my job to find out information that maybe they wouldn't want out or they didn't know about. So and the, the role of a reporter is to get information, uh, just like that's the role of um, law enforcement investigators. It's, it's, in some ways, it's the same skill set. So I was interviewing some of the same people that they were interviewing. It doesn't sound like there was a poor investigation in the case based on, you know, listening to your book. So I'm also a bit surprised why it wasn't solved. What do you think the holdup was? Um, I think that there were so many uh, suspects in the case. That was one of the key key uh, issues. And there was not enough evidence to charge someone for a case to go to trial and to convict someone. There was a lot of speculation on who the killer is. If you ask any person in the area here, they'll go, oh, it's this person, it's that person. Oh, I know who the killer is because so-and-so told me that they heard it from their you know, cousin down the street that it was you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's, no, so I'm not saying any names, <laughs> but they did not have that smoking gun, so to speak to say, yes, this is who it is. Each of these uh, women were last seen with this individual and then they were never seen again. And the individual told someone that he killed them. There was none of that. They did not have, they didn't have a confession. They didn't have witnesses. They didn't have witnesses that put any of their known suspects with the victim on the last known moments of their lives. In other words, they didn't have any evidence. Which is amazing to me. They they didn't have any. I wrote that down, like evidence with a question mark. They didn't have any evidence and and they didn't. So therefore, they weren't ever able to put together point A to point B. You know, they weren't able to connect anybody, which must have been incredibly frustrating and must have added like an element of sort of dread to the to the city. I mean, at that time where these suspects talked about like while the killings were happening? No, not while they were happening. But, you know, af after the killing stopped, when some names uh, began to surface, people were like, oh, I know this person. I know that person. But during the same period of time, people in the public were calling the uh, the district attorney's office, state police, to give tips and to say who they may have thought the killer is. Um, and I'll tell you, during that period of time, it was a very bad period of time for soon-to-be ex-husbands uh, because a lot of angry wives were, were soon-to-be ex-wives were calling police to say, you know, my ex-husband or my you know, estranged husband is the highway killer. And this is the reasons why. When, where did you where did you find that information? How does that how does how did you obtain that information? Talking to people. <laughs> yeah. Talking to people. And it's you just and, you know, what what's interest also interesting is because no one knew who the killer was. Um, people started looking around them uh, themselves and in their neighborhoods and in even in church and say, could this be the killer? Could I be? Uh, sitting next to him in a pew? Could I be sitting across from him in a restaurant? Is he sitting at the bar? Uh, is he in the store? Is he working with me? Is he a fisherman? Is he a, um, a lawyer? Is he a doctor? I mean, there is so many individual. Is he a cop? There is so many individuals that came under the microscope. Absolutely. And uh, one of them that you wrote about in your book, Kenneth uh, Pont, is very, I guess, controversial character and seems quite suspicious to me. I know he passed away. What are your feelings on, uh, on this person? I'm glad that you brought him up because there was a good reasons for police to be uh, investigating him. 
Now, there are some people in New Bedford who will tell you that the district attorney's office uh, was scapegoating him, uh, that they had no reason to, they hunted him, they had no reason to be looking at him as a suspect, when they had very good reasons. He knew many of the women who were killed, and that isn't necessarily mean that he was the killer, because in a small community, people travel in very similar uh, circumstances, like people who who have a podcast know other people who are, you know, podcasters, Uh, writers, know writers, nurses, no nurses, teachers, no teachers and drug addicts, no other drug addicts. Uh, And he was a recovering heroin addict who became a cocaine addict. He relapsed and became and was uh, addicted to cocaine. He was also a lawyer uh, and he was really trying to keep his addiction hidden. So he knew a lot of the people that were on the street and he would have some of the women who were on the street get drugs for him and come back to his house and he would do coke with them. Um, And he was kind of weird. You know, I described some of the situations and his paranoia in the book. So they had very good reason to look very, very closely at him. And he was also not cooperative at all with investigators. And he left the area about a month, month and a half after the last killing. So that was all, you know, red flags with him. And he was a bit of a jerk. That was the other thing. He was just very much a jerk to the uh, to the cops. And he was never off their radar, was he? Never, never, ever, ever. He was always on their radar. The, um, there are some investigators who still say, yes, he, he was the killer because he was charged in one of the cases, but the charge was later dropped because there wasn't enough evidence to substantiate it. He was indicted in only one of the cases, and that was for the uh, murder of a woman from the Cape who was originally from Falmouth, and her name was Rochelle Dapriello. Uh, she was uh, staying with him for a period of time, and based on the timeline that investigators were able to put together, they believe that he may have been the last person to uh, see her alive. So that they built a case just on her murder and, but not with any of the other ones. But he had known a couple of the other victims. And also he, he phoned the police at one point about a uh, videotape. Can you tell us uh, about this story? Well, this was before the, the murders. It was a very weird, weird uh, situation where he was claiming that this was an age of videotape as opposed to you know DVDs or streaming. And he was uh, claiming that the film that was being shown on his TV screen was a snuff film and it was a comedy. And he was pointing out and he was hallucinating and pointing out, you know, don't you see that? Don't you see that? Don't you see what they're doing? And the cops thought that was very, very strange. And it stuck in their heads. It really uh, stuck with them. Right. And there wasn't any any murder over, I think it was Porky's, yes. the movie that he had rented. I, uh... Yeah, they, uh, they took the video, examined it, had it forensically examined to make sure there wasn't any hidden images in there. And it was just a plain regular videotape. But that's a rumor that persisted in the case, that, uh, that there were snuff films made. <laughs> What's interesting about that is another state police investigator who said that when he was starting to uh, also look at the snuff films and he started talking to people and realized that it may not be snuff films. Someone may have been talking about, and this is where Southeastern mass accents come in. They were talking about smut films as a sm- as opposed to snuff films. Um, they, so they were looking at the production of pornographic films made locally and to see if any of uh, the women who were found dead, if they were in any of them. And they were not able to find any evidence of that. Wow, just talk about like a gross element to it. I mean, it's a tragic story in itself, but you just add that layer of, of that, that element and it just gets like real dark. Yes. Yes. Everything that happened in 1988 with the the murders of these young women really is very, very dark. And it is very, very tragic all around, especially when you realize that of the 
11 who went missing, nine of them had children. So tragic. Yeah. Awful. So uh, two of them are still unaccounted for. Uh, two of the victims are still unaccounted for. And what's, what's interesting about these two cases is both women were tied to law enforcement uh, somehow. One, her mother was engaged to a Dartmouth police officer. And in the second case, the second woman, uh, her father was a retired New Bedford cop. And that's why when people who are not familiar with the case will say, oh, if these women were the you know, daughters or sisters of cops, you know they would have found the killer. And this is a prime example that you have two cases where, yes, the victims were relatives of members of law enforcement. And you know that they wanted to find, number one, find those two remains and find the killer. And there, there was a lot of discussion on why these two women remain missing. Is it because the killer hid them so well because of their ties to law enforcement? Or is it simply that no one found that exact spot where they are? I think that they haven't just haven't found exactly where they are. Because if you drive along the highway sometime and you just look from side to side, there could be bodies over there and you don't know it. Oh my God. As, as a crime podcaster, I, I think about that as I drive on the highway. I do. <laughs> I can't oh help my it. God, me too. <laughs> I mean, would, even on the, the ramps in some of the smaller communities, you know, we're not talking about Boston, but you know, get outside of the, of the city. A lot of the ramping systems, you know, there's woods, there's trees. Who goes in there? You never know what could be in there. And these cases are all believed to be met by the same killer. Yes. Yeah, they, they do believe that it is the same person. Number one, because of the, the victimology, uh, where the women were found, how they were found, it, it does appear that they're all uh, tied together. They were all believed to have been strangled, even though the cause of death was only determined in two of the cases, positively in two of the cases. And was there ever any indication of what they were strangled with, articles of clothing or... Yeah, in, in two of the cases, it is where they were able to determine cause of death, it was uh, articles of clothing. Um, in the other cases, because of the condition of the bodies, uh, they weren't able to determine how they were strangled. Very chilling. Yeah. And I know that John Douglas and the um, FBI's behavioral analysis unit got involved, I think, for a short period. Do you know if that was helpful at all? It, it was... Uh, but I think the state police were hoping, uh, and remember, this was very early on, uh, they were hoping that somehow this would be the magic bullet for them, that the, uh, the, that the unit would be able to tell them, you know, this is exactly what you're looking for. And they, they can't do that. They can give you some broader parameters. Uh, but, you know, they, they were hoping for more than they, than they had. Have you looked into other killings that might have happened prior or, you know, before or after this string of homicides happened? And this was like every month and sometimes two or three times a month in for the New Bedford Highway serial killer. Is there is that pattern evident in, in any other serial killings that you've maybe looked into? I've uh, during the, at that time, there was I looked at a case in, in New York that was around that same time with Shawcross. They ruled him out. Uh, there's some uh, serial killings in Connecticut. I know that they looked into that to see if that was in, uh, tied to it at all, as well as the uh, killings in New, New Hampshire. Uh, they were looking at any and everything across the country, and there did not seem to be uh, direct ties to it. That doesn't mean that there aren't, but they could not find any ties to other cases. What about the Lisbon Ripper? That is a different type of, they did look into that. It was a different type of murder and not quite the same as uh, the New Bedford cases. Yeah. And the reason why I bring that up, because it just sounded like it was very out of the blue right there on my part, is that that, that happened in Lisbon, Portugal, and the uh, detectives from Portugal visited New Bedford to perhaps see a connection or to get, you know, maybe some sort of professional advice. I just thought that was fascinating. 
And, and one of the reasons why is because there are so many people from New Bedford who are um, from Portugal or have families there. And there is a lot of travel between the two countries, between the, the city and uh, Portugal. So that, that was something that could not be ignored. Interesting. And uh, so many good local suspects, though. Can you tell us about Tony DeGrazio? Yep. He was uh, a young man from uh, Freetown who had, he came to light through the investigation. He had a two previous charges of rape. Uh, both of them were, he was found not guilty. Uh, one of them involved uh, two teenage girls that were hitchhiking or he offered to give them a ride. And they said he was sexually assaulted them. And he was later found not guilty in Fall River District Court. He had a history of, at least according to some women who were working the streets, uh, of picking up prostitutes and uh, raping them or beating them. Uh, and he was eventually charged in those in a string of cases as part of this investigation. He was looked at by some as a very good suspect in the case. But again, there wasn't anything that was a smoking gun in, in the case to uh, to charge him in uh, the murders. But he did have a string of sexual assault cases. And he's no longer with us as well, right? No, he, he's, he has since passed. He's dead. And, and he, speaking of that, how did Kenneth Pont die? Uh, Kenneth Pont is a very, depending on your viewpoint, it's a very sad end to him. He's continued to spiral out of control and he died alone in his house natural causes. Uh, he continued to use uh, coke. He was found in the room, like the living room where he had a bed in his living room. He was uh, had been there for a number of days. It was uh, it was was not a pretty sight. So he died alone in his house, in maggot filled house at that that point. It was yeah, it was it was gross. It was trash everywhere. It was filthy. It was. Um, it, it wasn't good. So he. It, this is a man who, you know, actually he was the poster child originally for drug recovery. When he was a heroin addict, he got arrested for possession. He got help, went to college, then later got his law degree, got his uh, record expunged so he could become a lawyer. Uh, I mean, he wasn't a top lawyer in the city, but he was, an, you know, an attorney and had his own cases in district court and civil court. And, you know, he was mildly successful. And then drugs grabbed him again and his life completely spiraled out of control after um, after the charges against him were eventually dropped. Some would argue his life was spiraling out of control even before. And right before his death or not right before his death, but within like, a, I guess, a year or so, uh, he his his old residence was dug up by police. Uh, yes, yeah, so there had been a persistent rumor that uh, well during 1988 he got a new cement deck in his backyard, and there was a persistent rumor that one of the missing women, uh, Christina Montero, was buried underneath the deck. That deck. Years later, the uh, the district attorney in Bristol County uh, was able to convince the bank, which at that point owned the property, uh, to allow them to go there and dig up that cement deck. And they did, and they didn't find any human remains. Now, uh, I know one rumor that seems pretty common in unsolved cases is uh, Satanists or a group of group of Satanists. Did you uh, ever find any truth to uh, those rumors or anything substantiated? No, 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 no. There were no there was no satanic cult involved in this case. It was it involved drugs, but no, no Satanism, no, no dancing in the Freetown State Forest, uh, conjuring up uh, demons. None of that was involved in this. Well, that's a relief. Yes, but I still will not go into the Freetown State Forest alone. The, the very sage advice right yes. there. <laughs> and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. When this was happening and you were reporting on it at the time, did you think it would be solved? Yes, I always thought it would be solved. And friends of mine at the time were would joke that, you know, as each new 
a piece of evidence would come forward like, ah, yes, the killer is going to be found. You know, so-and-so is a killer. No, so-and-so is a killer. Uh, I was always convinced that the killer would be found. And I still believe that eventually the killer will be identified. I have no doubt at all. How is that? How's that information going to come to us? Do you think it's going to be through DNA or law, like found evidence or tips? I think it'll be all of the above. I just realized when I said that, I mentioned every every single way it could be solved. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's it. Because we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And that's the one thing that I've always, I, I learned early on uh, as a reporter that never assume anything because you are always going to be wrong. So it's look at everything. Um, and, and I do believe at some point that the killer will be identified. Uh, will he be alive? I don't know. I hope so. I hope he winds up going to trial. Uh, but at the very least, I think we all need to know who he is or was. And, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yes. And I did see that the Bristol County DA's office released a statement mentioning DNA testing, which uh, I, th I think they said they have completed it. So uh, I, I don't know if you heard anything about where that's gone or anything, but it that could definitely be a helpful avenue. I guess it's hard to know when all that all those crime scenes were processed before DNA was really a thing, um, how well that evidence uh, was preserved. Yep. And, you know, that's the one thing. And we have to remember that this is is a an open murder investigation. It's a cold case, but it's an open murder investigation. So that the investigators do keep certain pieces of information uh, quiet and to themselves. They do not comment on uh, the DNA evidence, what is available, what is not available, what is usable or not. But back then, they were doing what was then state-of-the-art DNA uh, testing. And that since then, they've also done uh, tests on other other things that were found at the, the scene, including, you know, fibers and things like that. Well, that's good to hear. Is, is your relation is your relationship is your working relationship with law enforcement easier to navigate now that you're not the court reporter or the, the crime reporter as you were writing the book? Did you communicate pretty well with law enforcement? Yes. Yes. Uh, when uh, as I was writing the book. Uh, one of the upsides of revisiting the case uh, years later is many of the investigators, uh, the primary investigators are now retired. So they felt much more comfortable talking about the case and talking about certain aspects of the case while still preserving the integrity of the investigation. So that's and, and it, it, because I'm not a daily newspaper reporter uh, any longer. Uh, they, there is isn't that fear that somehow whatever they tell me is going to be, you know, online or in the newspaper the next day. Yeah, that that makes sense, and they probably see that after so many years have passed, that this is only for the benefit of the case. Like at this point, some tip might come in because they read your book, and and they 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 have to see the benefit there. Oh yeah, uh, uh, of course, and they they know that the more publicity the case gets, the better, and it will also perhaps make people feel much more comfortable with coming forward. Because in this case, it could be that the longer it is, perhaps the easier certain witnesses uh, will, find, will find it easier to come forward. Witnesses back in 1988 may have been afraid, rightly or wrongly, coming to come forward. Uh, but over a period of time, you know, we're talking 30 plus years, uh, people's lives change. So they may feel much more comfortable because they're out of that world and feel more comfortable in coming forward with, with evidence or testimony about uh, who the killer is. Well, that would be great. And keep in mind that, that they, need, they need more than just someone saying, I think this is who the killer is, or I know who the killer is. They need something that will hold up in court. Yeah, I mean the, the that version of circumstantial evidence like was was pretty good earlier with uh, with Kenny. If you're looking for circumstantial evidence, there was a lot of it there. Regards to him, how has the rest of the community reacted to the book? Like the locals and uh, some of the families of the uh, victims. They've been very very uh, supportive and really wonderful. 
uh, especially the families, because reliving um, 1988, 89, 90 for them has been very, very difficult because we have to remember these. This is a story of real people. These are real lives. These are real families. This is real grief. And when I'm writing about them, I always have to keep that in mind that they are this. This is going to touch them to the soul. And that's a a responsibility that I have to maybe try to ease their pain, but nothing will ever ease their pain or grief. Uh, Finding who the killer is might help, but they'll still be missing sisters and mothers and and daughters. And they're all they've all been pretty willing to go go out in the public. They, they've spoken with you. They've done interviews. So I feel like there's a sense of I don't want to say urgency because it has been uh, so long since the crimes took place. But it feels like there's still a sense of uh, they're, they're still motivated. And uh, do you get that sense that they're still motivated for this? Um, y- yes. The families don't want this to be forgotten. These women cannot be forgotten. People cannot forget that there is a killer out there of nine, most likely 11 women. He's gotten away with it all of these years. This is not right. The victims, yes, they were addicted, but they didn't get a chance to recover. And there's no doubt in my mind that more than likely all of them would have gone into recover recovery and had very productive lives and been reunited with their families And life would have been so much different for their children, for their siblings, for their parents. And someone took that away. They stole a future. Yeah. And we talk about it all the time, the secondary victims and the ripple effect that these crimes have. And it's not just one person committing one crime. You you just described what it potentially did to the entire community because you took somebody out of a community that could have been a positive uh, contributor to, to the community, could have been a, a potential school teacher that changes the life of, of some young person, you know, and that person goes, <laughs> grows up to be, you know, an amazing author or something, you know, like it's just the potential was taken with all with those nine to 11 victims. Yes. And, and, and the person who did it just kept on living went on with his life. It, it is just the hardest thing to imagine that someone could be a killer in the community and is still walking the streets. Because I do think that the killer is from, uh, from the community. It is, it's not someone who uh, happened to drive through. You know, there's some people who, people who don't know uh, Massachusetts or don't know New Bedford, if they're from the Midwest or the West Coast, oh, can it be a long distance trucker? Well, anyone who's driven on 195 knows that, you know, yes, there are some, you know, long distance truckers who come through there, but it's try maneuvering a large rig through the streets of New Bedford. That's not going to happen. Um, so it's it's not the same type of killer that they may be seeing in the in the Midwest or elsewhere in the country. That, that's an excellent point. And even yeah, and even some of the the, the spots where the where the women were found, a, a truck would have been noticed. The state police would have noticed the truck. Uh, they patrol those roads, uh, and even some of the highway ramps where the uh, some of the victims were found the secondary roads to get to that uh, truck, to, to get onto the highway, it would be difficult for a truck to maneuver with E. And to not uh, like cause a scene, especially when they're not doing this like once a year. This was, again, once a month, sometimes twice a month, sometimes three times a month. Like this was so regular, someone would have seen it a, a semi stopping you know. Especially on Route 88 in, in uh, Westport. Uh, for the people who aren't familiar with Westport, uh, Westport, Massachusetts, Route 88 in Westport, that, that's the main road that goes into to Horseneck Beach. And that is a secondary highway. You know, it's your typical New England roadway, one to two lanes heading to the beach. It's not, if, if you had a big rig there, it would be noticed. 
And someone in town would have called the police to say, well, there's a truck over there and, you know, maybe better check it out. Yeah. Trucks make a a lot of noise. You know, I I suppose whoever put those bodies there likely had to have done it fast. You know, I guess there are no credible eyewitness sightings that really came into play, huh? No. And and, and that is, in this case, why uh, why time was on the side of the killer, Uh, because... By the time the bodies were found, people can't remember back three months, four months, five months. You know, when a body's found in July and it's believed that the body was probably left there in March, no one's going to remember, oh, I saw a car there on March 5th or, you know, April 10th. People wouldn't, it wouldn't be in the radar. They would not be thinking about that. And if they did uh, come back and say, oh, I saw a vehicle there and it was, a, a tr- you know, like a white van or a white truck or, you know, a sedan, they're not able to give the specific date, the specific time. They don't have a plate number and you don't know if it was the killer's vehicle. Without spoiling anything, you said that uh, during your first reporting on the crimes, you thought you knew everything. And then once you were writing the book, you found out uh, some some more elements to it. Without spoiling anything, what are what are some of these examples that you can point to that that came to you and surprised you? In, in many situations, there were cases with during the grand jury investigation. At one point during the case, District Attorney Ron Pina at the time convened a special grand jury, and a special grand uh, jury was aimed at just hearing evidence in this case, hearing testimony in the case. Um, He wanted to get all of the witnesses or potential witnesses, their testimony on the record. In case one, they died, and uh, to just narrow it down. It was an investigative grand jury to force them to cooperate with law enforcement. And I was able to obtain some of those records. And when I was looking at news stories that I wrote at that time and that others wrote at that time, we were thinking one thing was going on uh, in the grand jury, but there was so much more going on. The depth of the investigation was really amazing. And they did bring up many, many more suspects in the case before the grand jury. Um, They did explore a variety of avenues, things that the public didn't realize at the time. Um, And because it was secret, grand juries are secret, people wouldn't have known it because it wasn't a public record. And, And for good reason. You don't want to malign someone Um, and have them labeled as a potential killer when they just happen to know someone who was a victim or knows another suspect. Um, So it was, but I I was really amazed at some of the additional information that that the grand jury had. Well, incredible job with this book. We uh, invite all of our listeners to check it out. The audible version or the actual reading version. And please, before um, before we wrap up, please tell us about your new book, The Ghost. Uh, the Ghost it is, it just came out in June. It's called The Ghost, uh, The Murder of Police Chief Greg Adams in the Hunt for His Killer. It is about the, the murder of uh, Greg Adams in 1980. He was the a chief in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania. That's a very small community. It's sort of like a storybook town um, in Pennsylvania. The uh, the killer was a man named Donald Webb. He was from, at that time, from New Bedford. He was a small time uh, Kodawam. Uh, he was down in Pennsylvania with uh, some other people. He's believed to be down there with some other people, uh, scouting out some jewelry stores and other places to rob. Uh, the group that he worked with were from, they were called by law enforcement, the Fall River Gang, and they would uh, go up and down the East Coast, pulling jobs at burglarizing some uh, jewelry stores, uh, homes, restaurants, wherever there was large amounts of, of uh, cash. And he was driving through Saxonburg. Police chief stopped him. A uh, fight ensued, and the chief was Uh, killed and he took off and he remained a fugitive for decades. He was 
on the FBI's most wanted list and was hunted by the FBI for a long period of time until he was eventually found in in 2017 uh, by the same people who had hunted Whitey Bulger. Wow. This sounds great. I can't wait to uh, check out this book. Yeah, come come back on any time to talk about that book, and I will uh, I'll let you know how much house cleaning I got done while I do the uh, audible version of this one. Yeah, but I will not tell you how it ends because it is a remarkable ending, uh, and I it will surprise you. Amazing! Well, you you know wait. how to do those big market teases. <laughs> <laughs> this well, story just grabbed me uh, from the start because I was. Again, working in New Bedford when I started down there about five years after the murder and people were talking about more of the the killer's stepson who had been a New Bedford cop than the, the killer. And I had always assumed that he had been caught or he was dead. Didn't know that he was still out there. Wow. Okay. Can't wait to check that out. Thank you so much for your time and uh, joining us here on, on the show. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.